What is up, everybody? Welcome back to Think Twice, a weekly show where we talk about things going on in the world of Magic the Gathering, gaming, and pop culture. As always, for episode 20, I am your host, Justin Parnell, joined by my co-host, Ali Antrazi. And this week, we're going to be talking about the Star City Games Invitational, the quickest way to improve your Magic game, and our review of the Justice League. Look, mine's going to be quick. Uh, I was sick last week. <laughs> I was not. That's, that's it. Just that's... I was. I was not. I was not in a good way. When when you, you when you reach thirty, and you know, you're over the hump of thirty years old. Your body starts falling. Your body apart. starts breaking down. And usually, like when I get like a cold before, I could just be like, "I'm not sick," and just tell myself I'm not sick, and maybe be sniffly for a day or two. And then, like, that was it. Didn't didn't miss any work. Like, didn't have to stay in bed. I felt like I had a cold that just, like, just beat the crap out of me. I mean, you are old. You're starting to get old. I am getting old. Gray. That's Both of those are true. You go to sleep at, you go to sleep at 6, 6 p.m. I wish I could be asleep at 6 p.m. That sounds great. They're exactly. It's from just... driving home from work, unfortunately. Yeah. So, now, whenever you have a kid, yeah. you will just gain, like... 10 years. Mm -hmm. So you are technically older than me by age, but by what's the word I'm looking for? What's the word I'm looking for I'm, here? I'm not sure. By technicality. By technicality. I'm 40. So I am older than you because kids add like 10 years to your to your actual age. To your technical age. Is the that's the term? <laughs> okay, your technical age. Okay, so I know. I mean, that honestly, I was, I was, I stayed in bed like essentially like three days in a row, and then uh, over the weekend I watched Justice League, which we'll uh, we'll, we'll get to in a little bit. Ollie, yeah, it was amazing. You were not sick. I was not sick. Last weekend I played in a hex tournament. It was a one k. And I finally broke the ninth place streak. You get eighth place? Uh, no. Seventh. No. Sixth. No. Fifth. All right, I got first place <sighs> in the Swiss rounds. Oh, you didn't give me a chance to guess. In the Swiss rounds. So during the Swiss rounds. Okay, so in the tournament, you ended up first going into the top eight, and then you got eighth. I was first going to, going into top eight. Okay. And then in top eight. Uh -huh. I dropped zero games. Well, that's, that's pretty impressive, actually. And then in the Swiss rounds, I dropped one game during my last match. That didn't matter if I won or lost, but I wanted to be I wanted to be first seed for no reason. Just so I because. Won. But but your record was tarnished because you lost a game. Exactly. So it's like you lost the entire tournament. <laughs> Not at all. It was great, actually. The new new format came out. Um, what is the what? So a new a new hex set had come out yes. a couple of weeks ago. It was it was called what? Dead of Winter, like the board game. Sure, and it's a good board game, by the way. The first actual event was the weekend we were in Baltimore, and I tweeted out and said, "Hey guys, you guys should play this card called Dark Heart of Nulzan. It's a, I think it's very well positioned. I'm not sure who played it." But then this last week I played it. I played what I played what I told the people to play. And I got first place. So I got I got to take home five hundred cash money dollars. That's pretty good. And then on top of that, I got some in, some bunch of in-game stuff. All for the entry fee of seven dollars in game currency, which is seven ticks, which is less than seven dollars. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah, actually the, the winnings end up being more than the winnings we got at Baltimore for me. Sure. Well, especially when you include like entry fee, travel, travel, hotel, even food. Like I understand you always eat, but when you're at home, you don't, you're not going out. You're eating grocery your store. Yeah. You're eating like cereal or eggs. I <laughs> so you're eating breakfast. You're yeah. forced to eat breakfast when you're at home. Yeah, actually I got up, made egg. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's a secret. Get up, Make yourself eggs and bacon and sausage. Take a nice shower. Take a nice long... Wait, well, hold on. Poop. 
bacon and sausage. Actually, don't don't it. That's that's too many meats. I can't I can't encourage this. I ate bacon, eggs, and sausage. Look, if you're in the over thirty crowd like we are, I do not suggest repeat. I do not suggest eat bacon and sausage before you play in a tournament that's not at your home. I'm hey, just saying the only way to get those gains is through eggs, bacon, and sausage. That was, I, I, that, that, was, that was French. The second one was okay. Anyway, so <laughs> so, you, so you won. So you won the event, first place. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. It's nice to win a tournament. Yeah. So so I got fourth. We got fourth place at the Balt- We got fourth place at the Baltimore Open. Then I got first place. First place in hex. So this means this weekend, I will get ninth place. That. I feel like that's that's not very optimistic. Uh, we'll get that. We'll get that later. <laughs> uh, optim- optimistic for what you feel like you're working with. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, speaking of the event this weekend, Ali, you and I are both going to be playing tomorrow, actually, in the StarCityGames.com Invitational in my hometown of Roanoke, where we're both at right now. So... Uh, we are going to jump out for a second and then be back to talk about what we are going to be playing in the Imitational. So, Justin, tomorrow are we having the bacon with the sausage? No, no, we're not going to have either of those things. What about the eggs? <laughs> no, I don't have any of those things. I'm not a breakfast. I'm not a breakfast guy. Are we? So what, what are we doing? What's uh, what's our meal before the tournament? Well, I would like to have some sort of sausage, some, some sort of carbohydrate. Carbohydrate? Some, yeah, like a muffin. You, or a muffin. A muffin? That sounds delicious. No, you need that substantial energy food. Yeah, that, I literally just said carbohydrate. That is energy. That is... You need brain food. You need, you need peanuts? Granola. I love peanuts, yeah. I'll probably have some granola. Some bananas? What if I, Look, I, I'd like to have a muffin and a yogurt parfait with some granola in it. I how, like about, mu- how about that? I like muffins, too. What's your favorite muffin? You know, I like I like an old... I like a classic blueberry mutton with a really thick muffin top. All right. I like just the, the original muffin. A, a bran muffin? No, just the, the original. What do you mean? What is original? What is original? There's no... What was, it's not a flavor. Are we PG-13? What? <laughs> what? Uh, the, the chocolate. <laughs> I do not know what's going on. I think we're just going to move on. All right. So... So tomorrow yes. is invitational. Yes. The formats are modern and standard. Both. At the same time. You have to play two matches. Oh, oh my God. That's you crazy. play two matches at once. No, I think we play standard first, four match, four rounds of standard, and then okay. four rounds of modern. Okay. Um, so, Justin, what are your what is your weapon weapons of choice for this event? My weapon of choices, choices, choices. So, uh, as as we talked about last week, I am not someone who who plays standard at all. Really, the last time I played standard was actually at the Star City Games Invitational. In July, and that's actually also the last time I've played modern. Now I do I do play modern a little bit more. I just haven't played it in the last five months necessarily. So I am not playing anything that uh, you would consider exciting. I don't have any tech. I don't have any decks that I feel comfortable with. So I'm simply playing in standard the deck that I feel like I will get me the most free wins, and that's Rummy Up Red. So are we talking about like? Roman up red with the Desert Strangler. Roman up red with like no, that's way too slow. I'm trying oh. to get people dead. Might as well just be called Roman up dead because <laughs> on turn five, someone's dead. <laughs> either you, or either your me or my opponent. Yes. Well, to be fair, this deck, this Roman up red deck, does, does have a lot of reach. It does have a lot of reach. Uh, well, the game will be decided by turn five. All right, all right. Um, I can see that. I, I do feel I, I've watched a little. I have watched a little bit of standard and. One, I, I just, I feel like I want to be playing one of the most powerful cards, and Hazard is definitely one of the most powerful cards in Standard. 
So you said you said you've been watching Standard. How exciting has it been watching Standard? On a scale of one being watching a sloth all day. Okay. And ten being a unicorn jumps out from another dimension and hands you a million dollars. Jeez. <laughs> that is a, there's a lot of steps in between those two things. <laughs> I'm just I'm um, making sure we get this the full I'm making sure we get the full spectrum. I think here, it's like okay? a, I think it's like a three. Alright, so it's, like, it's not the it's not the sloth. No, it is the sloth, but what's well, the one is the sloth. You're not watching him all day. No, one is watching the sloth all day. This you're watching the sloth for three hours. <laughs> okay. Where and then he does a phone flip. Where does where then, does it hands you a dollar? Yeah, that sounds about right. Okay, that's not <laughs> where, but I do have a question though. Where does the sloth watching end? Like what 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 value does are you no longer watching the sloth? Uh five. Five? Yeah. One through four is sloth related? <laughs> yes. Four is four. I would watch I would like to watch a sloth do a front flip. Is it that's, that's a three? Is it slow? It's it's <laughs> it's, 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 it's like it's slow. Is it like he's doing it in the slow motion? No. It's it's or like this it's, is a regular speed front flip. So it just come out of nowhere. It's like well, he thinks it's a front flip. It's like a side flop. Well, that sounds like a two. That sounds like no, a two. No, that's a sloth. Well, what's a two then? A two? Yeah. You're watching the sloth for the sloth for half a day. So half full day. a day? So a full day. One's a full day. Twelve hours. Like half a day I'm awake or half a day of twenty four hours? <laughs> half a day of They're awake. awake. Yeah. Okay. So like eight hours. Yeah. <sighs> Good lord! No, that's a three. It's a three. <laughs> it's a three. Yeah, yeah, it's a three. It's the it's the it's the attempt flip sloth with a dollar. In modern, I am playing Grixis Death Shadow because, as you guys know, uh, I have played Death Shadow to some pretty good success in Legacy. Um, so I am familiar. Brags. I am familiar with. <laughs> no, this is just stating the basis for my future failure at this tournament. Don't say that. Um. So I am I am familiar how to pilot a Death Shadow deck just in general as far as like like fetching fetching your lands how to manage your life total where's a safe life total to be at relative to what it takes to kill your opponent so yeah, I am comfortable with that and I do feel like I could actually com comfortably pilot this Death Shadow deck even though it's difficult just based on my experience in Legacy so I am gonna play that I feel like that's I think I'm pl I'm playing two good decks I'm playing two tier one decks. Even though I'm not as familiar with standard as most of the other people in the event, I feel okay. I feel fine in modern. I just haven't played much recently. Okay, so I got a question for you. Yeah. When you're playing against an opponent, mm. you see what deck they're they're on. Do you ever battle them lore wise? No. Should I? Like I'm saying, like, you're, let's say if I was playing you and you're playing Grixis. Yeah. In my head, I imagine I imagine you. As this guy with a hoodie on, yes, just standing in the dark. Yes, you have you have no shadow, and as your life gets slower and lower, the shadow this, gets the bigger, shadow gets bigger, bigger, and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. That sounds awesome and more menacing. That yeah, sounds it, it sounds like an anime, right? And then you have one. The shadow looks. The shadow looks B A. All right, it looks super. You can just, just you can. All right, say it. the shadow looks bad ass. I don't really think you're gonna say that. Too late. I said it. <laughs> But then, but then, like, but you're like panting. You're on the ground. You're dying. I'm on my last breath. Yes. But However, my shadow. Your shadow is, is like ready to go to town. Pounding fools. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you do you ever visualize that? No, but that's pretty sweet though. Yeah. If you describe it like that, why would anyone not play Death Shadow? Because Tron, you're like you're like building these. Tron, you're uh, you're a wizard that can barely find his pants. No, you're Urza. You're literally Urza. And you, you, you got to build your tower, got to build your mine, got to build your power, your power plant. Then they all come together. GG. No, what happens? You make Karn. And, and lore-wise... He made Karn Urza so much later. Made Karn. He made him so much later. It doesn't matter. It's just cool to think about that. Anyways, well, I think, I so think, on, a scale I think, of, on a scale of 1 to 10, yeah. you're playing you're playing Greeks of Shadow. Yeah. How ex same scale by the way. This the sloth to the unicorn, million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> what is your number for shadow? I think it's like a six. A six? Yeah. What's a six? Six is a flying elephant 
throwing peanuts around, but then not eating the peanuts, instead of giving you a hug. Do I get to eat the peanuts? Yeah. I'll get peanuts and the hug. And the hug. Oh, what's a five? A five is, that's when we leave the sloth territory. Yeah, you're right, fresh out of sloth territory. Yeah, you see a flying elephant. You just see it? You just see it, yeah. But you're just like, oh, was that a flying elephant? And you're No, just... you see it. You know the flying elephant, but you're the only one that saw it. A six, you get, you get, to, interact with, you get to interact with the flying elephant, you get the peanuts, and he gives you a hug. Okay. I will go with five and a half then. Okay. I think it's right between <laughs> seeing it, because I'd rather uh, modern to me is more exciting than simply seeing it. But it's not nearly as exciting as interacting with it and getting a hug from it. All right, fair enough, fair enough. So five and five and a half. All right. Okay. So so so, so this so this tournament is basically a. It's like uh, four and a half. All right. Yeah. Because I'm putting more weight on modern. Fair enough. All right. Now to be fair, like based on your scale, no tournament magic tournaments don't reach like they don't even they don't approach ten. Um. There are some decks that some decks that get ten. Like, some decks that are a million dollars, unicorn from another dimension. Yeah, get out it's, of here! It's like, rare. It's rare. How man. many time warps are you casting? Exactly. Okay. <laughs> well, you're not. It's a hundred percent time warp deck with Drace of Mind Sculptor and qualifying, qualifying for a Pro Tour. No, Grixis Dash has a six. I've changed my mind. Okay. I've thought about <laughs> it. I've really, I've run the numbers in my head. It's a, it's a, it's a six. And my excitement level for this tournament is a five because these are two formats that I'm just not super right. into. It's only a five because I'm here. Ugh, it'd be lower otherwise. I know. Okay, so what were you saying? Sorry, I interrupted you. It's fine. So my my choices for modern, I'm sure you know what they are for modern anyways. I know your one choice for modern. Yeah. And that would be uh, Affinity. Close. Mono Red. Closer. Also Grixis Death Shadow. No. Boggles. No. <laughs> I'm playing Jess Guy. Oh my gosh, that was gonna be my at least twelfth guess. <laughs> I'm learning I'm learning the Jess Guy way. I do I do I do like the Jess Guy. There's because they're monks and I like Dragon Lord Ojitai a lot. I like how you're like praying right now. I am. I'm people can see you. A... It's a Dragon Lord Maybe I should play Dragon Lord Ojitai. Dragon that's a powerful card, man. No joke. That's a powerful card. Is it is it better than is it better than Karanos? No, because Karanos just defeats black green decks. <laughs> it does. Yeah, uh, historically, a black green deck has never beaten a Karanos that has uh, made its way <laughs> to the battlefield. It's never happened. I mean, if you have seen this happen, listeners, tell us the tall tale because you will be lying, but you can tell us the story. <laughs> Karanos, god of storms. Yeah. So yeah, so I'm playing just guy for modern. I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited about it actually. I guess I'm, I guess some sweet new changes, which is not that not that sweet. I'm just playing more snap. I'm just playing more snapcaster mages. Thank you, thank you're you. You're welcome. I suggested suggested strongly you do that. You're you're right, and we're playing the old serum versions. Yeah, not four though. Not four, but 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 we need to hit land dropped and dig and also the scribe too is a nice way to protect yourselves from the shadow of death. Yeah. And then for standard... So hold on now, okay. before we get to standard. All right. Ollie, I'm really impressed with your decision, because normally you don't have the deck decided until 10 p.m. the night before the tournament. So you've clearly cho chosen your decks, correct? You know what you're playing in modern, you know what you're playing in standard, you're completely prepared, and this is... You're going out of the normal. Uh, and I'm, I'm proud of you for it. So, I'm sorry, I interrupted you, though. You, what you said you, you were going to say what you were going to play in standard. Yeah, for standard, I have uh, literally no idea what to play. That, was, that didn't last long. <laughs> that did not last long. I'm sorry, but I don't know. Like people, people tell me, people are telling me to play Teamer or some sort of energy variant. But the problem with that is, I don't know how to board. I don't. I do not know how to. I don't know how to sideboard with the deck, and I'm, I'm afraid of mirror matches because my you, opponent has more reps than I do. And that's why I am playing Rami up red. Well, that's why I want. Uh, originally, I was leaning towards approach deck because it's kind of like a, kind of like a control deck. It plays Search for Conta, but everyone's telling me don't play it. You, you didn't even give me that as an option. You said, "Should I play?" Well, because some, Teamer with Black or Teamer with Blue. 
<laughs> well, someone do the word blue, yeah. That's called that's called moist teamer, and the black one's called well, teamer. Hey, careful, no. careful with this one. Okay, well, <laughs> I don't know. Teamer, this is one. I'm just teamer not going back. Okay, is that is, is that okay? Anyway, uh, I suggested you play teamer black because I watched Steve Mann and I was like, that deck seems good. You should do that. <laughs> yeah, you're like, that deck seems good. <laughs> that's what I was trying to say. It's yeah, not not any mention of Steve Mann. You know, he's just a great player. But well, the, look, I didn't look. I got to watch. I got to watch S- Steve Mann a couple of weeks ago when we played in Baltimore, and I was like, yeah, that deck seems like it's it's functioning well. Steve knows what he's doing. Therefore, <laughs> based on simply seeing that deck for sixteen seven for seventeen rounds in a row, yes, that is my choice. You should play that. Well, okay. I don't know anything about the ends out of the standard. I know what decks there are, but I'm not. You know. Yeah, I've never drawn just, a hand with any of them. I just, I just don't know because I feel like someone like um, Joe, you know, you know Joe Herrera, like Joe Herrera I do and Charlie Patel, they're like they said, well, approach has a bad matchup against Realm Rep Red. It also had a, also has a bad matchup against the Pummeler decks, kind of. And then after game one against Teamer, the matchup gets the matchup gets a lot harder. If you lose game one to Teamer somehow, you're just you're just dead. That's not good, though. That's you, so. All those things you described made it seem like you don't want to play this deck. Maybe they're wrong. Oh well, well, are they? I don't know. Is Pummeler that bad a matchup? I did, uh, let me see. Justin Parnell, standard expert. I'm gonna say yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounded very convincing. Thank you. Thank you. I worked really hard on that argument. I'm I glad you bought it. I just, I, I just, I don't understand it. Anyway, I don't know. Okay, so there's no, so we'll, we'll update you guys uh, when we know what Ollie is playing uh, via social media and definitely next week on the show. So one thing I want to talk about before we move on is two format tournaments. They're pretty rare, but all of the Star City Games Invitationals are, are two format events. How do you feel about those? I do not like this at all. I, because the reason why is because you have, to, you have to prepare for two formats. You have to carry two decks, which means if something, heaven forbid, happens, your deck gets stolen, you lose double the money. It's hard, harder to acquire both cards. And then, and then on top of that, the top eight... Does not mean much, like if it's not indicative of your performance necessarily, right? Or of the best deck, really. Mm-hmm. Like if, if if some whatever deck, like you could go for example, the top eight's modern. No, it's standard. It's standard. Ugh. Okay, uh, the top eight standard. You could go, you could go eight and O in modern. Yes, and then go four and four in standard and, and make still the top, top eight. eight. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just not not indicative of that, and I just I just don't like it. Like I don't know. That's my personal preference. I just don't really enjoy it. I don't like switching decks. It's also miserable to like. Let's say let's say tomorrow, you know, I go four and standard. Yeah. And then and then I'm like I'm 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 hyped for the tournament. I know I make a, I made a good choice. I'm ready to battle. And then all of a sudden I go oh four modern because my modern choice is bad or playing against strong matchups or whatever it is. All of a sudden like my tournament's done because. I was half right, or and it's just yeah. it's not it's not that's kind of annoying for me. I think, uh, and I know what you're saying. Um, before I get to, to my feelings about it, uh, a few years ago when you were in the Players Championship, you were in a three format event, which is I imagine is even worse for you because yeah. you're you're someone who uh, you put a lot of effort into preparation for choosing your deck and identifying specifically how your deck fits in the metagame and when you have to double that it's just double the work for you and uh i imagine it just just makes it significantly more difficult and at the at the players championship i you and i both felt like you had the best standard deck oh absolutely and you didn't even get to play standard yeah you played modern and legacy yeah lost on a tiebreaker that i don't care for yeah um and 
you did not even get to play your standard deck. So it's not even indicative of your performance over all three formats in that sense. And in this one, like you said, it's you have to you do have to prepare twice as much. Now to to play devil's advocate, do you not think that that does at least make it it does make it about the person who's most prepared, ultimately the best player is going to win the tournament. Not necessarily the best player in the entire room, but um to make, think, to make it to top eight, you're I disagree with that. I think if limited is an option, then I could agree with. I could definitely agree. But when you have because you're testing multiple different skills. Right. Yeah. But when you have three different decks, like honestly, even for me, and I'm like quote unquote professional player, acquiring three different decks for standard, modern, and legacy is not easy. Yeah. Like I can play whatever whatever I want in legacy. Like I I am still controlled by by monetary value. Of course. Of course. So if it was like if limited was like I would love for it to be like standard. Uh, modern, and like cube or just a regular limited format. That'd be that'd, sure. that'd be sweet. Yeah. And I, I know, and for for a while, cube was possibly an option, and then uh, the pro tour, not not the pro tour, the pro tour or the worlds, the worlds took cube, right? Yes. That was sweet. Yeah, that was sweet. So for me, I find it it is more. It depends on the the formats in the events. Um, because I just don't, you know, like I was saying, I don't really play standard ever and I play modern infrequently. So this event is one I'm not necessarily looking forward to. I'm going to go because I'm qualified. It's, you know, 10 minutes down the road from a house. Right. And it's a, a free tournament that can pay me a lot of money if I do well. So yeah, yeah. I'm, of course I'm going to go. Yeah. You have, you have no reason not to. I have no reason not to. I was able to get a deck. I'm going to go. Um, but I don't. Like I wouldn't if if this tournament was six hours away and I had to pay to get into it, I I, w- I just wouldn't go. Right. Yeah. Like I th- this is not if this Invitational was two formats and those two formats were Legacy and Vintage, you'd go. I would be I would I would fly to this. Like like that's that's how that's the difference it makes for me. But it's really hard because I play more Eternal formats just because I don't play as much Tournament Magic as as Ollie does. That it really depends on. On the formats for me in particular, I, I do I do see what you're saying. I don't think it's I don't think that the the I don't think the structure of tournament is bad, but I do definitely see why some people don't like it. Right. So I know all you said you were going to get ninth place, but in the event, by the grace of Erebos, Crufix, I know what I said that you were able to win the tournament. Perfect. Which you've won before. You've won this tournament before, and you've got a token in your likeness, an angel token. Yeah. With your with your son Aiden when he was a baby. As a shield. As a shield. Well, you're prote- you were the shield protecting Aiden. I think he was a shield protecting he me. He was not a shield. You're holding you're cradling him in your arms. You're not like holding him out, waiting him for him to get attacked. <laughs> That's true. Anyway. It's actually it's actually a great token. It is a great token. Oh, bias aside, it's a great token. It's the best token. What Token, would you pick this time? I've thought about this, and I think I think I'd go with a Caldra token. Okay, the nine 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 Caldra artifact token. I don't think it's nine by itself. I think it's smaller than that. I think it's like a four four five five or yeah, something. It's a, yeah, it's a four four. I think I think yeah, I think the four four then it gets just equipped and gets huge. Would you? Like I get it because it's like there's not one. Well, it's that, but it, or your token. Why well, you don't don't take my token? Well, that's that's the only only other don't, option. Don't take no. It's there's a lot of other options. That's it. If I were to win the invitational, I know where it is, and I already feel like I should have a token for my contributions to Star City Games as a content provider. If you agree with me, you should contact Pete Hofling. His email address is president at starcitygames.com and let him know that I should have a token in my likeness for Commander Versus. But I don't yet. So if I win the Invitational, I want a 5-5 demon token with flying that is battling Ollie's angel token. That's what I've wanted for years. So, you'd be be- so you would be below me, right? 
I because I'm looking down, right? I yeah, you're looking. You're looking down. So I would be gathering evil necromancy power to destroy you, to easily destroy you. To not to think you destroy me. Well, you're a four four flying token. I would be a five five flying token. Right. So I know how to do math. Right, but I also have uh, the power of hope. Yeah, and I have the power of math. And I have the power of hope and aid. And math will will carry you farther in life. Listen, if you if you had, if you have your hand open, in one hand you fill a five five demon. Yes. The other one you fill with a four four angel. Hope and <laughs> sure, Aiden's poopy diaper. Yes, we win. And a four four angel. And and hope is what you will need because if you go into combat with Ollie's angel token, you will have to hope that my five five flying demon oh, yeah, token does God. not block. You'd be awesome if you made that token. Yeah. And then, and then sometime in the future, Aiden gets a token, and like he's looking at a statue of me, and he's like a human or something, or or, or whatever token he is, and there's there's the statue of me because I'm dead, and then you're in the background, and he's about to fight you. That would be that would That'd be, be epic. That would be epic. So I gotta get one first, and then and Aiden has to get Aiden one. has to begin playing magic. Yeah, we'll learn the comprehensive reading skills and math skills required to play. Yeah, start playing in events. Hope he can still get a, to- uh, a token by the time he's like eight years old, because he'll be a prodigy, and then win. Yeah, so youngest like four years down the road. That's not, that's not, not that far. It's not. Maybe we should get started now. Yeah, let's do it. Speaking of which, uh. This this rolls right into our next topic. So um, we are going to jump out for just a second, and we're going to be back in a moment with the quickest ways to improve your magic game. All right, Justin. Yes. I need the best ways to improve my game so that I can pass it on to my son, Aiden, so that he can... Win the Invitational by age eight and complete this token the, trilogy the story. The Circle of Life. The Circle of Life. Yeah. Wait. No, I ask you that. You're the you're the expert in how to get better. I'm here for quips and questions. Oh. So, All right. So Ollie, if you if you had to, if you had to say, why don't, why don't we just look? Why don't we list five things that we feel like are the most important things? So what is your what is your number one thing? My number one by clear, clear margin, no matter what anyone tells you, I promise you this is the number one thing. It's sideboarding. Not close. Why is that? This thing is taken for granted. Even the pros don't know how to do it correctly. Or not all pros. Very few know how to do it correctly. Mm-hmm. A lot of people wing it. And you statistically play the same amount of sideboard games at the very least as main deck games. No, you mean you play statistically, you play more. No, at the very least, you play the same. If you go, if you if you go O two, you play the same. Or it, or two O. You don't have to be a loser. I'm a winner. Sure. If you go O two or two O. If, if you only play two, so right. over the average tournament, you could say every other round you play three games. Regardless, you technically, you sh- yeah, you, sh- you, sh- you should you should play more sideboard games. You play one and a half as many sideboard games as you do main deck games. Yeah, and people don't pe- people people focus so much on their main deck, and their sideboard is left to their whims, whatever they can grab, whatever whatever is in their binder. And Justin knows me, mm-hmm. and he knows I focus way more on my sideboard than I do my main deck. Yeah, once you get your main deck down, you feel like you want to get your main deck within like 55 cards, correct? Yeah. And then those last five cards, it's like, yeah, we'll figure something out, but those are probably going to be the cards that are going to be coming out frequently in games two and three, which, as you said, you're going to be playing more of. Right. I know going into SCG Baltimore, we spent probably 10 times the amount of time talking about sideboard cards as we did the main deck. Oh yeah, deck. yeah. I made sure ain't like anytime we would go eat, anytime we're resting, I always brought up the question like always talk about sideboarding. Always side sideboarding always against sideboarding. sideboarding against storm, sideboarding against death shadow, sideboarding against company, yep, affinity, everything. Yeah, 
I am totally right. And I'm, um, I, see, this is like a, this for me, like tomorrow, I'm, I'm not going to be as prepared sideboarding as if I were playing a different, uh, like legacy or vintage. Right. Like in standard, it's going to be difficult. Like I'm, I'm copying a list of someone that I, that I saw and I'm going to try to figure it out. But I, I, I wish I did have more time to really learn the matchups. And this is really where you're rewarded for knowing a format and knowing your deck. Absolutely, because this is this is where you can make up the most ground in in your main deck discrepancy. Yes, right. Yeah, you learn what's good. What's good in your deck? What can come out? How many should come out? But the problem for us tomorrow, you and me, buddy, not just not just you. Yeah, you're going to be in the same boat in standard. Yes, especially if, if I play an energy deck, I'm 100 percent being in that same boat. If I play a control deck, I will still be in that boat. But not as much because you know, you might have some you might have some solid paddles exactly because for control I I, I know I tend to know what is good where and, and what and you're gonna like. know the the generalities of the card but maybe not the specifics of correct of the cards yeah by the tournament I'll have it down like eighty percent okay so number two what is what is your number two thing after sideboarding my number two thing is. Combat math. Which is interesting because you were telling me earlier that you felt a 4-4 four, four flying creature could defeat a 5-5 five, five flying creature. I'm not the best at combat math, man. I'm just saying. It's and important. That's true. See, this is where I think uh, I think of all of the things that is important, I think this is one of the things that I'm best at. Which is, I actually, I don't get to play in, in like limited tournaments very often. Um, but this is a really important skill in, in limited is combat math. It's something that's really simple because you look like you're just comparing numbers, but identifying when to attack into your opponent's blockers, uh, how to identify ways you can force through damage over the course of several turns, identifying ways to creatively create bad attacks for your opponent based on the blockers or the untapped creatures that you have. Um, these are things that commonly happen in limited, but in constructed, this is something you should probably, when you have a deck that you feel comfortable with, you should know the numbers of the creatures that you're working with. If I'm playing Grixis Death Shadow, I know I have a 5-5, five, five, I know I have a 4-5, and then a variant creature in Death Shadow, which is frequently like a 6-6. Six, six. And how do those... How do those creatures, along with like a 2-1 Snapcaster Mage, how do those add up to what my opponent is able to work with on on their side of the field as far as them being on defense? Because frequently, if you're playing an aggressive deck, you're more worried about attacking. If you're playing a defensive deck, you're more worried about blocking and how you can how you can either single block, double block to make sure that you can trade creatures appropriately while using an, actually another thing on your list, which is uh, something we can go into in, in a second, which is using your life total as a resource. But for combat math, what what do you feel like is the most important thing that you need to do? I know I just said a bunch of it, but yeah. if there's anything that I missed. I actually, this is actually my, I would say, my worst the, the thing I can prove on the most is com combat math. Mm -hmm. I actually, out of all these things that we'll, we'll talk over today, this this is the thing I'm worst at. And you see it because I tend to avoid it. I will, yes. I will play a control deck where combat math does not matter because I'm attacking with one creature in the air or whatever. When I'm attacking you, you're losing. I'll play a ramp deck where attacking with Ulmog is, doesn't matter. I can, I can just attack with that and that's it. Or or Emrakul or or whatever or from so I try to avoid this. Originally I avoided it because I didn't like it, and now I realize I don't like it because I just it's not a practice skill. Yeah, I also I, yeah I, I, I don't enjoy it. But if I was excellent at it, I probably would enjoy it a lot more. And that, that's not to say like I'm awful at it. No, but I'm not as this is something that's important that you feel like you have the most room to grow on, like you said. Right. Yes. This is this is. Well, I believe everything else is pretty sharp. This this one is still 
jaded or a little dull. Like, for example, even when you're playing a control deck, I know a couple of weeks ago when we were in Baltimore, um, there was a time when you had a Snapcaster Mage, and based on your hand, uh, it was like in like turn seven, you had an, a, a Snapcaster Mage that you that you wanted to block with, but I was like, you you should attack this turn. You, it was like you, this is this is an opportunity for you to force through two damage. You're not going to be blocking this turn. Uh, your creature is not going to trade profitably. You need to attack. If he blocks, then you can create you you can you can kill his creature where you would have to work a little harder to do so. And otherwise, if you if he doesn't and he takes two, your the combination of spells in your hand line up to be able to kill him in two a turn sooner. And you're like, well, I, I just want to block. I would just rather not risk it, not take the damage. Because you want to get in a position to win by eliminating all your opponent's resources. Yes. Yeah. So that goes to our th- our the third thing on the list, which is uh, knowing when you need to turn the corner. Yes, and this is especially important in decks like Jeskai, more so than other control decks or even ramp decks. Like it's pretty obvious when you turn the corner in a ramp deck. You're you know you you're done. You've cast your threat. Time to turn the corner. Even control decks, it's pretty easy. But Jeskai is the best de- definition of this, in my opinion, because you have burn spells, you have tempo tempo-ish cards, you have counter spells, you have sorcery speed spells. It's pretty... It's not intuitive, but you, you can technically try to turn the corner as soon as turn turn three, if you have, or five, or if whatever. If or even, yeah. yeah. If your hand lines up appropriately. Well, yeah. Or you turn the or you turn the corner turn nine or ten. It's 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 important to know when to do that. In in a ramp deck, I actually do want to give kind of an example. So we talked about sideboarding in a sideboarded game in a ramp deck. Like let's say you're playing uh, in modern like a, a red green Valakut deck or primeval titan, whatever titan shift, whatever you want to call it. Right. There is opportunities where. You're on like turn three, and you're like, "Do I want to take this turn to ramp further to give me a better opportunity to turn the corner faster, or do I want to take this turn to cast Anger of the Gods to stabilize my board by removing a couple of my opponent's creatures, even though I'm not going to get maximum value out of it? Is this the time to do it? Is this the best opportunity? So, so even though it it makes it take longer for me to get to the point where I can turn the corner, do I do this now? Absolutely, and I think that happens frequently when you're when you're deciding how to sequence your spells, whether you have have the ability to appropriately. And when we say turn the corner, we mean to decide when your deck is time to try to end the game on your terms. When you're choosing when to end the game, frequently this is attacking. Sometimes, sometimes if you're playing a combo deck, it's when do I combo off rather than trying to protect myself from being dis- disrupted. Uh, if you're playing a control deck, it's uh, you know, that doesn't have reach. It's when do I use my removal? When do I use my sweepers? And then when do I start start, start attacking my opponent and then force them to react to me rather than, the, than vice versa? Yeah, the, the most a really important one for actual pure control decks is when am I when when should I animate this creeping tar pit or celestial colonnade to attack my opponent? Yeah. Can I afford if this if if this land dies, I'll lose four mana or six mana. Can I afford this? How many cards does my opponent have? Does he have does he have the removal? Is this game one or game two? Game two, my opponent is le- a lot less likely to kill my colonnade as in game one. And you have to like know all these things and analyze them and just go from there. Know know when to turn the corner. And I think this is this is of of the list. This is probably my toughest thing. And we we when we were first talking about this, uh I think what I had said was, I, I I play a more aggressively than Ali, for sure, both both in deck choice and just in general. Yes, um, I never, I'll never miss an opportunity. I'll never have a game where I've where I've gone on too long in a defensive mode and not turned the corner. But frequently, I will try to do it too soon, and try to be on the offensive too soon when my opponent is able to stop me. And Ali is the opposite. I'm the opposite. I'm he, a, will, he will never do it too soon, ever. I'll never do too soon, but there are... Sometimes you sometimes don't do it soon, soon enough. enough. Yeah. yeah. But I found that I win a lot... Pers- I personally win a lot more games 
when I'm patient rather than going too soon. Yeah. And I think you're, even though there are, like we were saying, there are times when you don't do it soon enough. I think, I don't want to say that this is something you're bad at because I actually think this is one of the things that you're the best at is making sure that you know the exact time to try to win the game, to use your spells to win the game rather than defend yourself. Um, even though obviously all of these things for both of us and for most magic players can be improved on, but I do think this is one of your best things. Well, thank you, Dustin. I appreciate um, that, buddy. And this kind of this kind of goes hand in hand again with our the next thing on the list. So the next thing is being patient with your answer cards or your reactive spells. So basically, when do I kill that creature? When do I use this counter spell to counter that spell? Do I counter that spell? Or do I, do I let it resolve and then answer it when it's on the battlefield? This is a very important thing to know. And I find a lot of new players, or even players that don't, aren't, don't learn, when they're playing a control deck, <clears throat> and the reason they're not successful is because they react just to react. Immediately. What I mean by this is my opponent played a spell or two. I let them resolve. I can't just untap and draw a card. I have to do something with, with a mana. I have to cast a spell. But you I don't. Have, I have this removal spell in my hand. I need to use it. I have a target for it. Exactly. Yeah. If, if, if I, I have this card draw in my hand, I need to use it right now. Right. And, if you, and, and sometimes I feel like if they don't, they're doing nothing and they're going to lose. And that's while that sometimes can work out because of how the cards line up, that's not at all how you should be playing your deck at all. Not only control, but any deck. Absolutely. Because even in even in more aggressive decks, uh, you if you're if you're if you're patient, especially with removal spells and even reach like like burn, uh, the longer you wait frequently the more your options will open up on what those cards are able to do for you. Um, obviously, even if you're even if you're practiced in your deck, uh, magic is still a game where you're grant you're drawing a random card off the top of your deck every turn. You could still be prepared in what you think you know with all the information you know that your opponent's playing. If you're in a racing situation where you have a Tarmogoyf, and a Goblin Guide. And you're like, okay, I need to remove his blocker now. Even though he can't really profitably block this Tarmogoyf, I want to get through this extra four damage, so I'm going to go ahead and Fatal push this guy to get this blocker through. You're using all the information you have. He is a creature. I have a removal spell. I have two creatures. I want his life total lower. Kill this creature. Push ahead. Even though you can try to be prepared, ultimately... The longer you wait, the more options you're going to have with what to use that removal spell on, or if the burn spell needs to go to a blocker or to your opponent's face. This is something that I, I think is this is important in constructed. This is important, especially important in limited, when your important spells are a lot farther and fewer between. Right. It's important to know too when you can answer that card without removing it. Basically, with, with what you have on board, with your Planeswalker, your creature lands, your creatures, whatever. One thing that I want to talk about really quick is sometimes, you, for, for a control deck, you need to use your stronger counterspell rather than use your weaker one. What I mean by this is, let's say you have four mana in play. You pass a turn. Um, you have a, In your hand, you have a Disallow. Getting the Trials, Land, and Mana Leak. Your opponent plays a spell. You have to counter it. Traditionally, what people do is they will Mana Leak that mana spell. Leak because it's going to be dead later in the game, right? Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. So they'll say, oh, I'm just going to Mana Leak it now. It's going to be dead later in the game, and this allows just more powerful, more powerful card. The problem with that is, on the following turn, when you play a land and you play a Gideon, all of a sudden your shields are down. So in that scenario, you really want to disallow that, that spell and then untap, play Gideon, and then also have Mana Leak up for whatever the charge cast the following turn. Even if it's not something you can Mana Leak, having the option, because again, 
being being patient allows your options to open up with these in these situations with these type cards. Right. That doesn't mean that it's going to work out every time, and it's really important to not use past experience. Well, I don't want to say not important to use past experience, but it's not. It you you shouldn't take every every instance. Like if if a line doesn't work out, even though in theory the the patient line allows you to 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 be more choosy with how you're casting your cards even if it doesn't work out that doesn't mean that you need to abandon that in fact it's frequently the opposite do exactly what ollie is saying yeah and i i promise you too i've played a lot with mana league played a lot of modern just mainly specifically it will be good sometime um there was a match in, in, in the top eight where I was playing basically essentially the mirror match. My opponent had 10 lands in play. I had like 10 lands in play. And Mana League eventually mattered. Just, yeah. it's okay. It's not as powerful, it's not as powerful as this Lao or Cryptic Command. But hey, it costs two mana versus four or three. So the, the last thing on the list is what I actually think is the most important thing. Because this is the thing that people think they understand the best that don't don't fully understand how to use this resource and that is using your life total as a huge resource this is something you're also excellent at obviously mm-hmm. you play a lot of control decks so yeah this is something that's really important this is probably why maybe i don't value this as much as sideboarding because not not to be brag but you're I, very good at it i feel like this is easy but it's probably not as easy as i'm thinking i i know i know how to i know how to use my life as a resource i know when to punish my opponent for misusing their life as a resource like i love playing against death shadow players that do not know how to use their life source as a, as a resource where they mess up or they go one point too low or they're one point even too high so they can't deal you that extra point of damage exactly and yeah. and or the or the one point too low to reckon like Easily kill them with burn some couple burn spells or a calling attack. It's pretty great to uh, to know that and just not not only be good, not only be great at managing your life as a resource, but also managing your opponents by knowing when to attack it. Your, your life as a resource is very important because on turn on turn four, your opponent's casting Dahlia, Hertical Cathar. You have a counter spell. You're at twenty or eighteen. You don't need to counter it, even if you have no more, no more. If even if you have no move in your hand, you have plenty of time to deal with that card. It's 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 not a, it's not a, like a two turn clock. You have plenty. You have like like five six turns to find an answer, and you can save that counter spell that counter spell for something more important, like I don't know, let's say collected company or like mm-hmm. kite self free, free anything. Merely made eternal witness. Eternal witness. Anything. And I feel like using your life total as a resource goes hand in hand with actually all of these other things. With being patient with your reactive spells like you just gave in your example. Knowing when to turn the corner. Because just like you said, when other players aren't are, are, are valuing, are not valuing their life total appropriately and you understand that, it helps you understand when to turn the corner and of course combat math. When to know what how the combination of your cards frequently like you said jeskai control is a good example what is a dangerous life total to be at if you're playing against jeskai control the answer is seven because seven is an attack from a celestial colonnade and a lightning bolt or a lightning helix right um knowing how to use your life total as a resource allows you to use your combat math better because you can allow your opponent to make attacks they think are good because they're getting damaged through. But overall, if you look at it over the course of several turns, if you're attack if they're attacking you and you're attacking back, obviously like four turns down the road, how do those match up? You have 20 life to start with. You don't lose it two. You lose it zero. You, lose zero. you don't lose it one. It doesn't matter until you're at zero. It does it, and there, and this is some. This is important for both control decks and in modern right now for for Death Shadow decks. Uh, the you don't lose if you're not at zero. That's true. 
it and, it, and, and that's going to be a truth in Magic. Unless you're playing against Infect, and you lose a 10. <laughs> that's different. But because, because you have this incredible resource that everyone gets, everyone starts with 20 life. You don't. You can take nineteen of those down and it's still win the game. The flip side of this, though, flip is I want to say, I've seen plenty of times where I'm playing a control deck, my opponent's playing a control deck or or mid range deck, and they're always fetch shock, fetch shock, fetch shock. I'm like, I understand I'm a, I'm a control deck man, but you are just making it much easier for me to turn the corner. Yes, I've this will I, come back and bite you. I've played plenty of mirror matches where. I'm always the one fetch tap land, fetch tap land, fetch mm -hmm. basic. My opponent's like fetch shock, fetch shock, fetch shock, fetch shock. I'm like, all right, now I'll just kill you. Because people are like, well, you're not attack, you're not an attacking deck, yeah. So you don't need, I don't need to really worry about my life total. Well, turn one, no, not really. Turn six, do you need, do you need to get this second overgrown tomb when you have? Four other black sources and three other green sources. Or can you just go swap? Yeah, like shocking yourself that that that's a snap. That's a snap cast mage hit. It does. That's the difference between drawing your terminal wipe and just dying because you you shock for no reason. It's totally. It's, it's important. It matters. And life, like in John, your life matters. You have Bob, and and burn that. And against just guy, your life matters because they have they have burn spells. Against even against blue white, like sure, this is like the slowest deck, and you can hurt yourself. But hey, they still clock you with. Colonnades or getting the trials or and and, and uh, whatever and one or two Snapcaster Mage attacks exactly and it, it, it matters uh, especially like what Justin said like maybe not maybe not turn one or turn two that much but turn six like do you really need to take that extra point damage even if you're and and we're not even saying like if you're at nine I'm saying if you're at like fifteen oh yeah absolutely because that still matters yeah. yeah your life total the, here's the thing. Your life total becomes more important to protect as the game goes, as, as not the game goes on, but as it gets closer to zero, of course. However, the importance in general of your life total is not any different from turn one as it is to turn 20. You have to keep, take that into consideration in all of those turns, every single one. And just because you're at a high life total now, even if it's late in the game, that doesn't mean that that, that resource becomes less important. Absolutely. Okay, Ollie, are there any other, any other ways that you can think of right now? I, I could go on for a little more, but I think, we need to, I, th I think we've covered plenty for now. Okay, awesome. Okay, so you guys know what time it is. Uh, we, are, we are at our, uh, our pop culture segment. This week we are going to be talking about the Justice League movie. So this is your spoiler warning. <laughs> If you have not seen this or do not wish to engage in discussion about this, this is your time. However, if you are as excited uh, excited as we are to talk about Justice League, hang on for just a moment and we'll be right back. Okay, so we we gave you guys a, a spoiler warning just a moment ago. Um, I want to give another warning, as this is not something that we f I frequently do on the show because I, I I want to make sure that as much of the audience as possible can listen to this show. However, um, based on my feelings of this movie, I want to give a an explicit language warning because I simply do not know exactly what I'm going to say as we start to get into this discussion. All right, before we get into this, before we get into this discussion, let me put on my boxing gloves. Oh, those, those you got your boxing gloves. All right, I'm ready. Um, whew. okay. Uh, I just want all the I want your general thoughts. Oh, on the Justice League movie, go. You know this. I know. I know. After, I know after I left the movie, I literally sent you a text saying, W, all caps, WTF, question mark, Justice League, dot, 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 dot. 
Yes. And you said, I haven't seen it. I haven't it. seen it yet. And I replied, okay. <laughs> yeah, just okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, period. Okay, period. And then you watch it, and there's a, there's a, there's a it's just storm happens. Um, I, okay, so I want to give you guys a little bit of a backstory for me. Um, because I don't want you to feel like I am completely biased in what I'm saying. I went into this, I went into this movie with low expectations. God, I had no expectations. Which is even worse. I went into this movie with low expectations. I've seen all of the previous DCEU, which is the, the DC Comics Extended Universe. I've seen all of those previous movies. Because of those, which I, most of which I do not think are good movies and I didn't really enjoy. Low expectations. That being said, I wanted this movie to be good. I wanted to be entertained. That's why I go to a movie. I paid my money to go. I'm still a consumer. I like comic book movies. I really wanted this to be good. That being said, growing up, I was a fan of Marvel Comics, and I did not like DC Comics. That still kind of lingers to this day. It's not that I hate DC. There's just things about it that I don't like and I think I, I just like Marvel better. I enjoy it more. I like the characters more. I like the stories they're telling more most of the time. That being said, again, uh, my favorite comic book movie of all time is The Dark Knight, which is a, a DC comic movie, you know, Batman movie. So I, I, I know, I know, I'm, I'm getting to it, Ali. I did not. I think this movie is. Crap. <laughs> Thank you. I think this movie's crap. I, think this is, I do not think this is a good movie. I do not think anyone should spend their money to go see it unless you really, really do not care about the quality of the movie that you're seeing and you just want to see stuff on a screen. Oh, if that's all you care about and you just want to see big characters, you don't care what they're saying, you don't care what the plot is doing, then you can go see it. Yeah. If you care about anything, if you care about any of those things, if you care about a cohesive plot, if you care about about writing that makes sense, if you care about your characters, if you if you care about what happens to, in, to particular characters and how they're portrayed on the screen, if you care about if you're consistency, fan, if, you, if you're a fan of The Flash... Or if you're a fan of Aquaman, just just don't go. I don't. Why? Okay. What can you? This is the question. I do not know if you're a fan of the Justice League or any of these characters. You're going to really want to see this movie, and you're going to be really disappointed because it's just not good. It's 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 a mess, like start to finish. Yeah, I don't I, I don't know what they were thinking. Let's let's start from the beginning. Okay, please. Let's start from the beginning. Okay. Uh not the very first scene, but one of the very the very early scenes. Big, or an early scene. Uh first of all, actually before we even start, I want to set up the universe, okay? Oh god, here we go. So I watched Batman vs. Superman, which is not a good movie. It's very also a mess. Plot holes. The characters do not make sense as far as what I uh, became to understand what Batman and Superman were about. They tried to set up a lot of the future of this universe in Batman vs. Superman. In that movie, one of the major plot points was Superman, maybe not a super great guy, because he he kind of leveled a city when he was fighting another bad guy in, in the previous movie. Batman even goes as far as the saying, and this is a quote that we heard in several trailers and in the movie, if there's even a 1% chance that Superman's not on our side, we have to take him out. This was a common sentiment through the movie is that maybe we're kind of, the, the world is kind of turning on Superman. Uh, but... Going into this movie, from the very first scene, it makes it seem, because Superman dies in, in Batman vs. Superman. That's not a spoiler. That movie came out two years ago. In the very first scene, it literally is like, Superman dead, world's in chaos. 
and like people are like crying on the street and crime is all over like Gotham City or Metropolis, wherever they were. And it's like, it's the saddest thing and everyone is so distraught that Superman's gone. That's not how it was in the prior movie at all. Actually, actually, see, I didn't, I didn't watch Batman, Batman, Batman membership, man. And you don't have to, kind of. I, I didn't even know Superman was dead until I still watched the Justice League, and for me, it was like he's dead. Okay. Okay, but I can't. Can, can you give me a small flashback, please? Can you tell me how he died? So here's the thing, and that's this is this is one of the. There's a lot of things that frustrated me. The fact that this movie asked you to be up to date on what had been happening in the DCEU before this is always a big problem because if you if you're if you're struggle if you're struggling to understand what is happening in this movie even if it's part of expanded universe you should still be able to watch the movie in isolation and be able to get you know 90 90 95% of the movie not the case here not only that as the movie goes on it punishes you for knowing details of what has happened in this universe because they just throw them away. They're like exactly what I said about Superman. They're now acting like everyone, he was completely beloved and there was no question and he was the greatest thing in the world and now that he's gone, basically the world is over and everyone's lost their mind. People are crying. There's all sort of crime. That's a huge frustrating part. Okay, now to get to the scene that I'm talking about. In the very beginning... There's these robbers that go into a bank. They take a bunch of people hostage. They're sitting down. They're crying. And then you hear Wonder Woman's music. She comes the comes to rescue everyone, right? The point, right. the point of this scene is to introduce Wonder Woman back in the movie and say, this is a super badass character. She's a crime fighter. She's a good guy. Here's Wonder Woman. Just remember who she is. The villains, whoever these nameless people are, set up this bomb in the bank. Pops it open and clicks a timer that says 20 seconds. Literally saying, I'm just going to blow up with this bank because I want madness. I'm just going to I'm just gonna die and all these people are going to die and this bank is going to blow well, up. Well, he, he wants to go back to the Stone Age, essentially. One... That doesn't make any sense. You're literally just, this is like, I understand this is a comic book movie, but this is like terrible. This doesn't, the, the writing doesn't make sense. So Wonder Woman comes in with her music and then she's like, I got to get, I'm going to save these people and get rid of this bomb. So uh, Wonder Woman fights with this guy for a couple seconds. And then the guy turns with his gun to shoot the people, the, host, the, pe the hostages that he's taken to shoot them, to kill them. Keep in mind, during this time, there's a bomb that has 20 seconds on it that's going off. So this villain wants to kill these people 10 seconds before they're going to blow up. Just, just to be clear, <laughs> this is what he wanted to do. He's like, no, I'm going to shoot these people 10 seconds before they explode to this bomb. I want to get them. And then Wonder Woman comes in and she's like, she deflects all the bullets because the guy goes down the line with his like machine gun and is trying to shoot everyone and he, she's deflecting all of the bullets. So after she deflects the last bullet, she like punches him and he gets knocked out. His gun flies. And then there's a couple of seconds left. She grabs the bomb, flies through the ceiling, throws it in the air and explodes in the air. Hooray! Now, uh, now the unfortunate part about this scene is when he sets this bomb up, he says... There's four other bombs just like this. Throughout the city. Or blocks away or something. Yes. Guess what they just never address? Those bombs. The bombs. Like at all. Yeah. Justice League! <laughs> <laughs> I, wish you, I wish you could see what you just did. <laughs> it's so... This is, this is literally five minutes into the movie. And this is... They're setting the tone... For no logic whatsoever. For a shit show. And it's a, it is a shit show. It is a shit show. That's literally what I have to describe the movie to my girlfriend. I want to go see this movie with my girlfriend, Meredith, her two sons, Parker and oh, Levi. God. This movie, it, it doesn't make any sense. Okay, let's keep going. Let's none of it makes sense. Right, let's okay. Let's keep going. What are the mother boxes? What are they actually? Their power. What? 
They're they're just there. They're 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 not actual. They're not they're not powerful. They are at power. What does that mean? What? Um, what are they? Are what they purpose like- they serve? They just showed up. These are oh, these things are super important, but yet we don't know anything about them. This universe has existed for five movies now, and we're just now finding about the most important thing in these this world. Yeah, at and least- there's one on Earth. So is it as powerful? As- and and <laughs> is it as- there's one where Wonder Woman came from. We were just there in the last movie. We were just there. Is there what? Like, what are their purpose and why? What? Their purpose is the MacGuffin. You know what the MacGuffin is? No. The MacGuffin is a basically like a prop, an item frequently that a plot is based around. That's all they are. There's this thing. There's a box. The mom box. The mom boxes. Mother boxes. Mother. <sighs> okay. Uh, sorry, I could, uh, you're going to have, th- okay, normally I keep, I try to keep the rails, you have to keep me on the rails for this one, because I can just... Go off? Yes. I, I don't know how long I've been talking, I think a, a while. Anyway, <laughs> w- what what else? You talk, and I'll address stuff. Alright, I was upset because, alright, this whole movie, they say Superman's dead. Uh-huh. They didn't tell me Superman was dead. Yep. Or, the, or the, they didn't tell me how he died. Yep. I'm like, okay, whatever, I can live with that. So they're fighting. They're trying to recruit. It's so hard to recruit people, but they're recruiting anyway. They they miss on Cyborg. They miss on Aquaman. For whatever reason, they keep missing. And then finally, the bat, the villain gets the mother box of Atlantis. Blah blah blah. They have to unite. Okay, they unite. They fight him, and this oh my god boss is super powerful. He destroys a million Amazons. The the Justice League can do anything to him. They they're like ants he's destroying them so they're like okay we need Superman uh, Batman is the one that wants Superman back to life even though he's the one that proposed if there's even a 1% chance that he's the enemy we have to take him out exactly that, in that voice so, yeah that was his voice so okay so that was me actually saying Superman's voice in case I fooled anyone right so they bring they bring back Superman what's we'll and Superman, well, I know I understand this is like a thing in comic books. He he he, he stands up. He sees them like skeleton. He's confused. He's just came back to life. All right, I can let go of that. But then he just utterly takes a shit on all the heroes, and it's not even close. It's not even remotely close. It's like a joke. All right, I can understand that. Whatever. But then he fights the boss, and. It's I like, like how you call the boss, by the way. Like a video game. <laughs> he is a boss. He's the final boss. And it's not even close. How do I explain this? It's like... It's like Super Saiyan 5 fighting Krillin. Yeah, that did not help me at all. Okay. But yes. <laughs> it's, it's nothing. He crushes it. It's a joke. It's a joke. It's literally... like It's, a, it, it's just like can't do anything except for Superman. Here's... You know what the worst part is? So, okay, yes, Superman as a character is a terrible design. He's just everything. He's he, fine. It was proven in this movie that he is literally all of these other characters combined plus like eight other characters. Yeah, but it's about his story. I think I think his story is about his, like, not his power, but like who he is and what he does. But regardless, like... Yeah, that's why people want to watch it. Like, why couldn't the... Also, in the beginning, when when Batman first caught the, the fear demon, it exploded with green things. Like, oh, this is kryptonite. This will make Superman weak. Like, why couldn't they just do that? Why couldn't the demons, when they explode, they were green? Why couldn't they explode with kryptonite? Because just goo. Because I didn't think about that, Ali. I didn't think about that at all. But think, Superman oh literally... God. He's... he's the, the rest of the characters... Don't, don't mean anything. For the point of the movie, were meaningless. Absolutely. They were just a plot point to get Superman back so he could just do everything on his own. He literally did everything on his own. Yes. The freaking tagline of the movie on all the movie posters where it has all of the characters and it says Justice League and then it has words and in the words it has their all logos. You know what the you know what the logo, you know what the slogan of this movie is? You can't save the world alone. Yeah, you can. You just got to be Superman. Yeah. The rest of you, you're yep. meaningless. He can do all the things you can do. 
Yes, easily. Apparently. Okay. Several other things. I'm just going to go through quickly of everything go. I hated. So it's probably only about 40 minutes or so. Uh, Batman literally, he kept asking all of the people that he came into contact with other than Wonder Woman, but Cyborg and Aquaman and the Flash. He was like, who are you? What are your powers? Like when he went to Flash, he was like, what do you do? And then he threw something at his head, which could have killed him if he didn't have super speed. Anyway, let's let's just completely ignore that plot point that he said he didn't know what he did and then almost tried to kill him. No, uh, he, no, he, did, no, no he did try to kill him. Yeah, he did. Because he said he didn't know, but he does know. And I'll get to why in a second. Then he goes to Aquaman and he's like, where's this guy that can go in water and talk to fish? And he, he knows also who he is. One, y you don't think it's the guy that looks completely different than all these other guys? It's like super ripped. It doesn't look like a poor Russian person. Anyway, also, they immediately identified him as, as Wait, Batman. Side note, I need to start swimming. I need to start swimming to get my muscles ripped like that. Go ahead. I don't think, anyway. Uh, same with Cyborg. Here's the thing. In... Batman vs. Superman, they showed you that Batman had all the files on these people. All of them. And he saw what all of them could do. Their names, they even had little stupid logos, which don't make any sense, because in the real world, you don't have a logo. Batman has a logo. Superman has a logo. Those people don't have logos. You don't even know who they are. Where did Flash's suit come from? It just showed up. In Spider-Man, it describes how he gets a suit, and that happens for all characters. Because normally... It's a real world reason. And he's just like, uh, got the suit. Yeah. And they're just like, yeah, okay. The jokes did not land for me. None of them. No. I don't think I laughed at a single laughed a single time. They well, over sexualized Wonder Woman a lot, which has pissed me off because I thought they did such a good job at not doing that. In the Wonder Woman movie, literally had multiple scenes where like other members of the team are like oogling her, like Batman and Aquaman. Uh, this, well, maybe, what we meant about Aquaman was, why was he there? He never he used water power like one time. He was the cool guy. He was the cool guy. Yeah, but like what he, he used power he used oh power stop water one time. And that's it. Like he didn't do anything else. He he had his trident, but like, so what? He was just he was one one thousand Superman strength. Like, yeah, of course they all are. No, but what he stopped water for five seconds. Yeah, if that. And then he flew, and then he went down into Atlantis to watch uh, Steppenwolf, just awful name, get one of the mother boxes and do nothing about it. Exactly. And then on top of that, well, this last thing I'll say that made me maybe upset, the Flash. I okay. I watched the Flash on Netflix. Barry, I understand. There's a different Flash, different character. Whatever, but the fact that he they, they try to make him essentially Spider Man of the Justice League, just like young and new and whatever. So I'm just happy to be here. Yeah, get st like stop. And he's like socially awkward now. Like why is why is he so awkward? He's, he's, how many how many times in this movie did he trip? Like three, three. Dude, you all you do is run. You do, you just run. How you gonna trip? Like all over the place. A lot. He tripped a lot. <laughs> a lot. It was awful. And then at the, at the very end, when they had, when they had the race with when the Flash and Superman, were like let's race. I was like, Flash, Flash is faster. Why we're we having this race? I, I'm not even mad about that. That's fine. Because I'm mad about that because fucking. Sorry. Because it's the, fine. We gave the warning. <laughs> because the Flash can literally run so fast that he travels through time. You know what? It, even if they haven't established that in this universe, that doesn't matter. <sighs> All right. It just, that just goes to the point that right. Superman is is just just can do everything. I still got more. I, I still am not done. My least favorite scene in the movie. There's this scene where right before Aquaman dives into the ocean to go down to Atlantis to look at the mother box to see what it was doing because no one knows what it does. There's this like music and he's like walking in slow motion. And he has this whiskey bottle. Tell me if you remember the scene. He's like, he has this whiskey bottle. And it's like slow motion. 
and he goes and he like chugs this whiskey bottle and this big wave comes up. It's supposed to like make him look like really like a like a badass, right? Okay. He's chugging the whiskey bottle. After he's done chugging the whiskey, he takes it and he throws it into the ocean. He he's Aquaman. Dude, you were responsible for the ocean. You just <laughs> you just threw this gigantic glass bottle into the freaking ocean. He doesn't care. That's literally like Captain Planet taking a bag of garbage, slicing it open, and just flying over. Here you go, Planet. <laughs> Here's some garbage. <sighs> yeah, that, that is that is that is a tilt. Oh my god. Uh, uh, <laughs> bad, no, I'm not done. <laughs> Batman is the worst planner of all time. He literally goes to resurrect Superman, knows that something could go wrong, that he could get, like, be mad or angry. On top of that, he literally had a vision of a future where Superman is the enemy in Batman versus Superman. In that vision, the, the Flash tells him that Lois is the key, which is good. I thought that was a nice little continuation. And then, of course, what do they do? They go resurrect Superman in a stupid way, but I don't even, that's, a, we don't have time for that. <laughs> resurrect Superman, he comes up, he's like, oh, I don't know what's going on, so I'm just going to kill everybody. And he just starts beating the crap out of him, like you said earlier. Then he's like, bring in the secret weapon, and it's Lois Lane. Dude, just have her from the beginning. You're freaking Batman. You're literally supposed to be the world's best detective. You're supposed to be able to figure everything out. You figure nothing out. You're a terrible planner. You're a terrible team captain. You, I don't. I literally don't know what you did other than just mess everything up in this movie. All right, you know what the best part of this movie was though. No, was Batman's statement. What's your show power? I'm rich. That was the Flash asking Batman. Bass. Yeah. Yeah. That that's that, that was the funniest part. That was, that was the best moment. It was not movie. funny at all. It was terrible. And literally, <laughs> here's the thing: Batman is like supposed to be this incredibly resourceful, intelligent person that uses his money to enhance his ability, his, 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 his fighting ability. And he's like, Batman's supposed to be the world's greatest detective, literally. I think, I think this is the most poo-pooed you've ever, ever poo-pooed. Anything? Ever. Yes. I'm still, I'm literally still not done. I don't know. Oh, oh. So Lois is literally there. <laughs> and then she comes up and she touches him. And he's like, oh, Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's Superman. That's I forgot about that, dude. Just have her there the whole time, and on during this time when they're fighting Superman, you know what happens? What stupid Steppenwolf comes up, just comes in his portal, which is literally never explained at all, and just grabs the stupid mother box, and then he just trots off with it. No one's watching it. They're not watching it. It's the most important thing. You're not watching it at all. You literally use well, this to resurrect. The, this whole point of these mother boxes, they can destroy the world if the, all three of them combine. Luckily, it's better. You literally just lay it. It's laying in the grass. It's just sitting there. No one's watching it. Also, in the same scene, there's like two police officers, and they're like, oh, better keep our guns trained on Superman to make sure nothing goes wrong. And they're just standing there. They're literally just standing there behind Lois, like... I got my gun named on. Don't worry, ma'am. If he does anything funny, I'm gonna shoot him with a bullet. So anyway, they grab the they grab Steven Wolf grabs the mother box, which they just ignore because no one was paying attention to it because Batman's a terrible planner and they're all stupid. Oh god. What else? Uh, the villain was terrible. He literally had no explanation. You're just supposed to buy that he's this terrible warlord. Uh, oh, I thought who 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 was he? I don't know. He he's just like oh Steppenwolf, and then you're like oh yeah Steppenwolf. I've never heard of him, but uh okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was like mother, thank you for reviving me. Now I know why you brought me, revived me at this time. We don't know anything because no no, no you didn't tell us anything. You because just Tony is now dead. Perfect timing, mother. Thank you, dude. What, then, were, what were you doing the five thousand years that Superman was literally just not on Earth? You're just waiting. Dude, I don't know. He, 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 okay, so the power level discrepancy in all of these characters, because he was just beating the crap out of the rest of the Justice League. Oh my League, god. And then Superman beats the crap out of him. Like, just destroys him. Like, maybe, maybe look at Superman and was like, 
Why hate, is there justice? I hate, I hate Superman. I, I honestly, I hate Superman. I don't hate oh, him. oh, here's another reason. Okay, again, in Man of Steel and in the Batman vs Superman, one of the reasons that Batman thought Superman might be a threat is because he literally destroyed this city, like leveled Metropolis, and like a bunch of people died, like civilians. And this is like super concerning because he clearly didn't have a concern for for human life. He was just hell bent on on killing the villain of Man of Steel. And then when he's fighting, when he's fighting, what's his face? Steppenwolf. He wolf? literally stops fighting him, and he's like, oh, "Civilians." Oh, I'm gonna stop oh, fighting so this guy. That is annoying. That's literally beating the shit out of all of you. He's beating the shit out of everyone else, and he just stops. And then he goes get some civilians, dude. You literally didn't care. You leveled a whole city, and now you care when you have this guy that's literally trying to destroy the earth. The world, yeah. And you're like, well, better go save these few people. This building of civilians. Look at me. Yeah, 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 that, yeah that, that was that was that was. Hard. And he's like, "Don't worry, I'm Superman. I'm just gonna come back and beat him." If that's the case, just just, just beat him. Just beat him, because it took you all of like thirty seconds. You know what? He could have held Stephen with one hand. Another, he could carry the building. He could have put the building, save the building, took Stephen back to the fighting area where all the superheroes are for whatever reason, because you got because you're a bad movie, and fight him there again. Also. Alfred makes some comment. Batman's like, wah, 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 when they're going to fight Seven Wolves, he's like, oh, what's going on? And he's like, that's a team, sir. No, it's not. Again, it's just Superman. You're just props. There's just a bunch of props and Superman. <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was terrible. I I I literally could talk about this for another hour about like all of the things that I hated about this movie, but I think we've gone on long enough. So. Um, yeah, I think we have two. One thing, <laughs> one thing. I, will, I to sum up, I did not think this is a good movie. I think it was extremely inconsistent. I think the, I do not even think there's a good movie in here. I don't think if you rearrange the plot, I think this movie looks good. Yes, looks it good. looks good. It's clear they spent lots of money on it because it looked cool. This movie's probably fine if you ever watch the movie with no sound, not with subtitles, just no sound. Yeah, this was so the, you can't hear the stupid shit that's coming out of everybody's mouth. This was not a unicorn coming out of Portal. Get, get this is a dollars. negative one. <laughs> oh, no, this is kill. this is like watching a sloth for twenty four hours and then it gets up and it pees in your mouth. <laughs> that's what this was. And then you wake up and you realize it's the same day and you're, you're peeing itself. It's the gra- the Groundhog it's, Day. It's like Groundhog well, Day. A sloth. A sloth peeing on you after twenty four hours in your mouth. In your mouth. In your mouth. Um, but I, I did think it was funny. We discovered this right before we started recording. There's two post credit scenes. One you talked about, which oh, was yeah. Superman uh, racing having Flash. a race against Flash. Whatever. That's a fun little scene. There's two. Both of us decided we did not want to wait around for the second <laughs> post credit scene. Independently. Independently, without because yeah, we didn't talk about this. I I had a reason specifically. Did you have? What is your reason for that? I just I, I didn't give a a, a fuck. <laughs> you just done. <laughs> I was done. I was literally. The girlfriend looks to me, she's like, I was walking there, she's like, wait, I think there's a scene after, the, after this, do you want to watch it? I'm like, nope, let's keep, let's go home, I want to go home. Yeah, uh, <laughs> my reason was, see, post credit scenes are frequently for setting up for, like, future movies. <laughs> You're not watching any future <laughs> movies. <laughs> I will not be watching any more movies. This was the last <laughs> hurrah. I was like legitimately excited for Suicide Squad last year, and that movie was just not good. And I, I was hoping this was going to be good because they put so much time into it, and this is like their their big like hurrah moment for for DC Comics, and it, it was just not good. It was not good. It was movie. terrible. It was a terrible story. Like I don't, I don't understand how you can fail on so many different aspects. Everything, everything was bad. Who directed Who directed this movie? Zack Snyder and well, and Josh Whedon. Because Dex X stuff. This is worse than in my show, Lamond. Anyway, uh, we do have a question of the week. Our question of the week was going to be one of us was going to argue for the side of Justice League and the other was not. But However, neither of us were willing to take the positive side because I do not, I do not believe to defend. I, there's nothing to defend. However, we are still going to ask a question of the week. 
For those of you that have sat through this movie, I have one question for you. Was Justice League as bad as Ollie and I think that it is? This is our question of the week. We're going to be posting this on Twitter. You can let us know on the at Think Twice MTG Twitter account or at JParnell1 or at Ali Aldrazi. Was Justice League as bad as we think? Yes or no? If you, th- if, you think it, if, you, if you think no, I promise we won't tell you a new one. It's fine to be wrong. An old, yeah, we'll just tell you an old one. An old one. Yep. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'm, I'm kidding. Obviously, I, I, legitimate, give us your thoughts. It's legitimately, I, want, I, I, I like, seriously want to hear from people who like this movie. Yeah, I'm curious. I, I, I like. do. Because, like, please, like, sell me on Because I had no expectations. I had no expectations. Mine, were, mine were low and it came in under, which yeah. is crazy. It's not where you want to be. Okay. <sighs> okay, let me sh- shake that off so we can uh, do our do our outro. So, uh, that is the that is the episode for this week, guys. So, thank you guys for listening, and we will be back in just a moment. So, Ollie, we are both going to be doing the Invitational this weekend. I, yep. do, I do know that, so I don't need to ask you what you're doing. You're right. I'm going to be envying it up. That's right. I will be getting my demon token. It's like Massage and B. Wish. But, but with the eyes. I so wish you... that it was. I would rather have a massage. I would too, actually. I would rather have a massage. If I could win a massage rather than this tournament. Like, I know I can win money at this event, but I would rather just have, like, a 60-minute massage. I really? Mean, it's close. It's not even close. It's not close. I think it's kind of standard. I think it's standard just sucks. Mm, nope. It's no, I just take the massage for sure. Huh? Full body sixty minute massage? Yeah. Full body? Yeah. With a sloth? Maybe. It depends. <laughs> does he have his? Does he have his massage license? I don't. I don't know. <laughs> Okay, um, Ollie, where can people find you? You can find me at Twitter, at Ollie Eldrazi. You can find my articles at gatheringmagic.com. They come out, they come out every Friday. And you can find my Twitch stuff at twitch.tv slash Ollie Eldrazi. But usually right now I'm streaming Hex until MPG Arena comes out. Then, then we'll start streaming some of that. Super excited for that, by the way. Me too. But no, it's, it's going to take forever. So we'll... It's all right. We'll be. I'm. I'm, I'm a patient, man. All right. I'm a patient, man. You can, for now. you can find me on Twitter at jparnell1, and of course, you can find me on sargeofthegames.com and YouTube as the host of the Commander versus series. Uh, let's see, season finale coming out next week. It's a fun one. You should definitely watch. Uh, that was a really fun one. Even the the post kind of our post credits for for that episode mm-hmm. is a lot of fun. So. If you're a Commander versus fan or a fan of entertainment, if you like to be entertained at all, you should just watch that show for real. Uh, if you want to find the show, you can find it on SoundCloud. You can find it on iTunes. You can find it on YouTube. On all of those platforms, we would love for you to subscribe to our channel. We would love for you to share it. That is really important for us right now as we continue to get off the ground. And leave us a comment or a review specifically on iTunes and YouTube. Um, if you can do any of those things, that'd be so awesome for us we really appreciate it we again we're really trying to just get the word out we're 20 episodes in this episode 20 uh but we still want to expand our reach if we can do that we can continue to evolve the show and make it better which i feel like we have been but we want to keep going so you can also follow the show think twice mtg on twitter and you can email us directly think twice mtg at gmail.com We, of course, also have a Patreon. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash thinktwicemtg. We have two reward tiers right now, but we're really considering adding some more. And we'd love to get feedback on that if there's things you guys would like to see. Uh, We also have a lot of new $5 patrons this week, which is really awesome. You guys are the reason that this show is able to continue to move and evolve and that we're able to keep doing it. we want to specially thank Roy G, Gordon R, Dan K, and Scott W for being our our new uh, disciple of Bolus tier patrons. 
Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. And honestly, all I want for Christmas is some more Patreons <laughs> and some Bolus Magic. Well, it comes along with it. Because, oh, yeah. Because since they're the disciples of Bolus, we're also ultimately just disciples of Bolus. That's true. We, we all are. We all are disciples. Uh, so we would... We would we, we we cannot express how much we appreciate you guys and all of your continued support. Thank you guys so much. Again, you really are and what keeps this. I agree. He's right. You are, you are keeping this going, and we're actually getting closer and closer to our hundred dollar mark. Our hundred dollar mark means we start doing making a vodcast. So, guys, we're we're really close. We're sixty nine right now. We just need a few more. So, and and once we can do that, we can start releasing this in both audio and video form every week, which would be a lot of fun for us and for you and for guys. you. You'll see our facial expressions. You'll see us. I being promise silly. you, this episode in particular would have been better On if you vodka. could see what I was literally the pain in my eyes when and I was talking about the Justice League. <laughs> <laughs> um, for our Patreon supporters, every week I post a uh, poll for you guys to vote on a a deck list for me to create. Last week's winner, which I'll be posting, excuse me, when this episode comes up is Daxos the Returned, and I'll have a poll up for next week as well. So if you would like to see that Daxos deck and all the previous decks that I've featured on our Patreon page, you just need to be a Patreon subscriber. We also want to specially thank our director and producer, John Che, and our graphic designer, Amber West. We could also not do it without you guys. And of course, I could not do it without my lovely co-host Vanna White. Who? I mean Ali Antrazi. Who's Vanna White? You're Ali Antrazi. All right, all right. All right, guys and gals, thanks for listening. Thanks for support. Thanks for everything. We love you too. God bless, good night, and may you find that unicorn from another dimension that gives you $5 million.